So today we're going to learn about the complete benefits of using quasi-random numbers and sequences in your Monte Carlo simulation to get the best accuracy with the lowest number of random variables. We're going to talk about the disadvantages of using pseudo-random numbers compared to quasi-random numbers and then the benefits that you can get in your Monte Carlo simulation. To date we've been looking at variance reduction techniques where the whole aim has been we want to decrease the amount of random numbers that we have to compute in order to get the most accurate option valuation possible. And we're going to see just how much of a big difference it makes using quasi-random numbers. So let's get into it. First, we're gonna talk about generating random numbers for Monte Carlo. So to simulate our risk-neutral price paths in derivative valuation through Monte Carlo simulation, we lean heavily on Brownian motions. And this is the generation of standard normal random variables within our simulation. Now it's important to note most programming languages and spreadsheets like Excel include a uniform pseudo random number generator. This is going to generate integers between zero and a specified upper value where each integer occurs with equal probability. So a standard uniform random generator follows the mathematical definition of real values in the range between zero and one, where again, all these real values in that range are equally likely. So a pseudo random number generator is an algorithm for generating a sequence of numbers whose properties approximate the properties of sequences of random numbers. They're not actually random. The generated sequence is not truly random because it is completely determined on an initial value, which is called the seed. They are important for reproducibility in the case of Monte Carlo simulation and other simulation methods, and also the speed of generation. So with a standard uniform random number generator, we can convert these to standard normal random numbers. How do we do that? So let's first import our dependencies. We've got time, numpy, scipy, stats module, and then we're importing matplotlib, pyplot. So let's investigate the first method for creating these standard normal random variables from our uniform distribution. So we're going to approximate it with 12 uniform samples. So what we're going to do, a common approach is actually to generate 12 standard normal random numbers, add them together and subtract six from the total. The distribution of this combination has a zero mean and a variance of one, which is exactly what we need for the normal distribution. So we're going to make our random C equal to one, and then we're going to have uh, base e to the power of six, number of random variables. I've created a function here, which is add 12 uniform. So what we're gonna do is we're going to sample 12 variables from our uniform distribution between zero and one, and then we're gonna sum them up and then minus six. And we're going to do this for a large number of n. So we're going to time this and see how long it takes. So the computation was about 3.3 seconds, so remember that. So now we're going to look at some of the statistics. So we have the mean, standard deviation, skew, and kurtosis. And remember the standard deviation is gonna equal the variance when the standard deviation is one. So we've got a variance of one and a mean of zero. So it's been a good approximation for the normal distribution. But where it falls short is that we have a kurtosis. Now the way the kurtosis is calculated in NumPy is that they've subtracted three. So obviously normal distribution has a kurtosis of three, whereas this has a little bit less than a kurtosis of three. So with that in mind, what we notice is that it's a good approximation. However, we, we understand that the maximum values are minus six and six with this methodology, whereas there is a very small percentage chance that in the normal distribution, we can actually calculate and have uh, random normal values that are, that are higher or lower than that. And then we also notice that the ketosis is a little less than three, which means that too many values will be generated closer to the mean. So let's look at a better solution, which is the Box-Muller transformation. So this is an alternative method where we actually select exact transformation of pairs of standard uniform random numbers to pairs of standard normal random numbers. So we're gonna say that we have two uh, standard uniformly distributed random pairs, X1 and X2, and then we're going to create standard normally distributed pairs, Z1 and Z2, and they can be obtained with the following transformation. So I've coded that up here in our box Mueller uh, function here, and then we've added these together. It's important to know here with a box Mueller method that we're actually having to generate two random normal distributed variables at once. So what I've done is I've taken that in and I've divided it by two. We can see here that we've had an incredible decrease in the computation time from three seconds down to 0.05 now. So much more efficient method of actually calculating 
uh, in random normal variables. So let's take a look at our distribution. Again, we have a mean that's extremely close to zero, and then we've got a standard uh, deviation of one, a variance of one, and we've got a kotosis, which is much closer to three, and in this case, zero, because NumPy uh, minus is three. Now we're going to look at method number three, the Masala polar rejection. So this also requires pairs of uniformly distributed random numbers. And to avoid using the trigonometric functions of the box muller transformations, let's consider polar coordinates. So for this, we're going to consider random variables x1 and x2, uniformly distributed. Now not from zero to one, but minus one to one interval. That's important. Such that this can be generated as follows. And you've got to picture the unit circle here. So uh, we've got x1 squared plus x2 squared is less than one. So it's everything that falls within the boundaries of the unit circle uh, coordinates. So picture the unit circle and we have at the center of it, our coordinate zero, zero. What we're doing here is essentially we're getting our, from Pythagoras theorem, we're getting that length, that C value, um, and then we, that's W, essentially it's C squared. So it's the length squared of the unit circle. And what we're saying is we want it to be within the circle. So while W is greater than or equal to one, I want to keep on sampling standard uniform random numbers until this satisfy, satisfies this constraint. When it's less than one, when it's within the unit circle, then I want to calculate my C parameter, which is the square root of minus two log W over W, and then we can calculate our uh, random normally distributed pairs. So I've coded that up in our polar rejection function here, and we've got this while loop. So while any, and I'm using NumPy arrays here, so we've got this sum of squared function, which is able to calculate the W, and then we're looking for the condition where the sum of the squares of our uniform distributed numbers, our pairs of variables, is greater than or equal to one. And while we still have that true, then I wanna keep sampling and replacing those pairs. So really this is supposed to be a more efficient uh, method for actually uh, calculating random normal distributions, but because of some of the arrays that I'm using here in NumPy arrays, it's been a little bit slower at 0.117, but still very much better than uh, simulating 12 variables. So let's look at some properties. Again, we have a very low kurtosis and we've got the mean and standard deviation of one. So we're getting a more accurate representation with our polar rejection method. Now the last method that I wanna talk about here, and this is really what um, NumPy is using in the background, is we've got an inverse transform sampling. So all we're saying is we wanna use the uniform uh, distribution as an input to be able to generate our random normally distributed variables using this inverse CDF function. So the, now the cumulative density function of a standard normal distribution is given like this, and we're all very familiar with this. But this leads to a problem because it can be shown that the integral of e to the power negative x squared has no closed form. So using the standard elementary functions, and that means we have no way of finding a closed form for the normal CDF. It's important to note that this is a difficult distribution to work with because there are closed form inverse CDFs for the exponential, the Pareato, the Cauchy, the logistic, the Rayleigh distributions, you name it. But unfortunately for the normal distribution, we can't. Now, thankfully, we have a workaround, and although we're unable to find that closed form solution for the inverse CDF, it's not too hard to approximate it using numerical analysis. And I've left a link here that can direct you to the right places for that. So now, thankfully, what we can do is we can demonstrate this by using the point percentile function that's actually applied in SciPy stats module. So we can use the point percentile function, which uses a numerical uh, methodology to approximate these values. And essentially here, we're just going to sample from our uniform distribution and use that as an input to our point percentile function, our inverse uh, CDF approximation. We can see here that we get a very low computation time of 0 0.068. And our kurtosis and skew is uh, essentially the same as a normally distributed variable. Now, it's a really important to remember though, that while we have access to NumPy and Python, this is the best way to do it for sure. Essentially, they're using one of these inverse uh, CDF approximation algorithms, and the one that they're using is Sugut algorithm. But it's important to know that NumPy has been directly implemented in C, 
And therefore, this implementation executes way quicker than anything that we could implement. So, of course, we would use our random normal between zero and one, and then our number of samples that we want to actually sample from. So this computation time is the lowest at 0 0.03. So now to the point of the matter, we've gone through how you can generate all these pseudo random numbers that of course are seeded with a number. And that's what makes this sequence non-random. Turns out that pseudo random numbers are a bad choice for Monte Carlo simulation. So how are we gonna demonstrate this? Well, let's consider pairs of independent uniformly distributed random numbers. And we've got 500 points here. And what you'll observe is that you can see that there are clumps in this distribution. And then there are empty spaces. So it's important to remember that of course, both of these variables are independent and uniformly distributed. So every point on the graph is equally likely. However, we do observe these clumpiness and these empty spaces. Eventually, if we sampled enough points, then the initial clumps and empty spaces would be swamped and then all the large number of points would be spread evenly. But unfortunately with Monte Carlo simulation, the whole aim is to often reduce the number of samples and decrease the computation time, as has been the whole point with variance reduction techniques. So pseudo random numbers introduce bias through clumpiness and through empty spaces. Now in contrast, quasi random numbers offers a solution to this problem. They are often called low discrepancy sequences and are designed to appear random, but not clumpy. So they have the same statistical properties as random variables, much like pseudo random variables. However, they do not have clumpiness in their distributions. However, they avoid trying to be clumpy in the way that they're simulated. So quasi-random samples are not independent from the previous ones. In other words, it remembers the previous samples and it attempts to position itself away from other samples. So there are many methods to produce quasi-random numbers that uh, provide several low discrepancy sequences. Some of these sequences are the Foray sequence, the Halton, the reverse Halton sequence, Hasselgrove sequence, and the Sobel sequence. The behavior is ideal for obtaining fast convergence in Monte Carlo simulation, and we're going to show the Halton and Sobel methods because these are implemented in SciPy. If you wanted to use other methods, then you would have to find specific packages like OTTurn um, that could actually be used to generate these other sequences. So take a look at this link here. Now from SciPy stats, we're gonna import QMC, and this is, for this is specifically for Monte Carlo simulation. So firstly, we're going to look at the Halton distribution, and we've got our sampler, which is Halton, which is um, defined on a certain dimensionality, and then we sample a specific number of random variables. I've also done this for the Halton normal distribution, where we take our Halton, uh, distribution, so picture these as the uniform distributions, and then we're going to then use the point percentile function from SciPy stats norm uh, to actually generate our normally distributed variables. So just taking our Halton uniform distribution with dimensions two as we were before, you can see that this plot is a lot less clumpy and has less spaces than previous. Now we're going to look at the Sobel function. So with a Sobel function, we can only generate samples of uh, number equals two to the power of m. So it's base two numbers. So here we've got m, which is two to the power of m, is the number of uh, variables we're going to be simulating. And for the normal distribution, again, I'm using the point percentile function from SciPy. Now, if we look at how these are distributed um, in our dimension two, uh, with nine, uh, with two to the power of nine uh, number of variables, so 512, then we can see we get a much more even distribution uh, with less empty spaces than our pseudo random numbers. So what's the significance of this? Well, let's take a look at a real Monte Carlo convergence between the pseudo uh, and quasi random numbers. So we're going to just consider European option, which we have an exact solution for in terms of black shoals. And we're gonna look at the different methods of sampling to see if the rate of convergence changes. So our pseudo sampling methods that we're going to compare are the add 12 uniform variables together and then subtract six, our box Mueller methodology, our polar rejection method, and then our inverse transform sampling that's implemented by like the likes of NumPy. So we're also gonna look at our quasi sampling methods with the, which are the Halton and the Sobel from SciPy. So I'm just implementing the Black-Scholes formula here with the following variables. 
interest rate of 1%, underlying of 30, strike of 32, a time of 240 days, and a volatility of 30%. Now, if we take a call option on that basis, then we get a Black Shoals price of 2.18. So for our results, I'm gonna store them in this dictionary called results, and I'm gonna call functions of each one of these uh, different uh, methods from this functions dictionary. We're going to test a whole um, different array of numbers um, to test the convergence um, as we increase the numbers with different sampling methods. So we're just running through the Monte Carlo simulation and we're going to sample uh, different random variables with the different methods. Note that I have to do Sobel um, in a different way because again, it's uh, using base two to calculate the number of simulations. So here in our graph, I'm showing the difference between all these different methods over the number of simulations that we're actually using, the number of random variables we're generating, and the relative pricing error on the y-axis. So the relative pricing error is the price that we're getting from our Monte Carlo simulation minus our exact solution from the Black Shoals. So as you can see, we've achieved convergence in the black and the uh, purple line extremely quickly with our Halton and our Sobel method. So they are quasi-random numbers. And that's because we've got, remember, even distribution, which is very ideal for Monte Carlo. Whereas the pseudo-random numbers take a long time or a large number of simulated variables to actually achieve the same convergence on that price. So, Take a look at this graph in your own time and do your own analysis, but essentially we get large benefits from using quasi-random numbers within our Monte Carlo simulation, especially when the goal is to reduce computation time and increase efficiency. Thank you very much for watching the video. If you enjoyed this, I'd really appreciate if you uh, left a like on this video and subscribe to the channel for more content like it. If you're really keen on seeing uh, how I go about my process and uh, joining like-mind members in the quant community, please consider joining my Patreon channel and link in the description. See you later.